So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Vivek Krishnamurthy. I am I work here in Snorkel as part of the research team, specifically the computer vision team. And today it is our honor and privilege to have Shango Shin for our AI guest speaker series. Today Shango is going to be talking about universalizing weak supervision. Shango is a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So Shango, when you're ready, please take it away. Uh, hi, I'm Shango Shin, and I'm honored. So I'll be presenting two projects, uh, both uh, related to language model alignment. So first one is about combining diverse human feedback signals for language model alignment. And second one is about the mechanism that strong models can be trained with weak supervision. So now AIs are getting superhuman level intelligent and people are getting concerned about AI safety. So one of the attempts for that is human alignment, namely aligning language models with common human values, such as safety, uh, expecting aligned models will work for a human. Uh, language model companies like OpenAI, Anthropic, or Coir have uh, invested a lot to pursue this goal. But even without being super serious about the future of uh, human and AI, alignment is actually a prevalent problem in the use of language models. So for example, uh, companies uh, want to control the tone or style of language model responses and make them to follow company policy or uh, agreement. So basically we want to make language model behave in a specific way beyond uh, language model uh, conducting some tasks. So of course in the case we cannot um, enumerate all the rules that language model follows or all the templates. Again, this uh, becomes a machine learning problem. Uh, we collect or develop some data and hope that models can learn some true function behind the data. Typical alignment data set look like this. So there is a human instruction or prompt asking something and there are two different rep responses and a label that represents which response is preferred. This kind of data set requires a human notation uh, to label which response uh, is preferred by human. Of course, it's um, expensive, time consuming, and the, actually the worst part is that human labels uh, might not be reliable in this setting. So for example, if two um, language model responses are very long and it's hard to uh, read uh, for human, then the label can be essentially noisy. For this situation, actually, uh, weak supervision can be a very efficient alternative. So it's very cheap and efficient. And there have been a bunch of studies to control noise. Here, the basic idea is to consider preference label as a classification label. So if the first response is better, then give a label one, otherwise uh, zero. Then we can apply the existing weak supervision pipeline here. So write some labeling functions to compare two responses. For example, we can compare the length of responses or uh, sentiment of responses using some pre-trained models. And then we train a label model and generate final store labels. Then we can convert this uh, classification labels back to preference labels. But the uh, preference signal in real world uh, can be more diverse than just chosen and rejected. For example, um, instead of having two responses, uh, there can be multiple responses and labels can be given as uh, some rankings of them. DPO paper already proposed a ranking-based loss function on multiple responses in, in their appendix. Another form of real signal is scoring. So we can give some real number scores instead of uh, comparing um, response examples. Can we apply supervision for this type of labels? So uh, of course the answer is yes. And fortunately we worked on some of the necessary components two years ago, uh, extending label model to any metrics basis. To explain the main point of the project, uh, let's briefly go through weak supervision 101. So um, a standard weak supervision pipeline goes like this. First, users collect label sources. So label sources can be 
anything that provides uh, information about true labels, such as heuristic, um, predefined patterns, knowledge base, or even pre-trained models. And then using label model, uh, we estimate the accuracies and correlations of label sources. Next, considering the um, accuracy of each label source, label model generates uh, pseudo labels. We train the end model with those pseudo labels eventually. So here, our main focus is label model. Specifically, in label model, uh, we use graphical model to capture the relationship between uh, weak labels and true label. Here, lambdas are weak labels and y is uh, true label. Uh, we want to learn accuracy and correlation parameters, but uh, learning accuracy parameter is tricky since we can now observe the true labels. But uh, here, conditional independence can help us. So here, the conditional independence means that uh, weak labels are correlated only through the uh, true y, as you can see in the left um, graphical model. Here is a simple example with binary labels. In this setting, we can know the product of accuracy parameters uh, by the rate of agreement between uh, weak labelers. This can be easily derived using uh, conditional independence. And using such a relation, uh, we can solve a simple nonlinear system of three labeling functions and get the accuracy parameter of each weak labels. So this method is well known uh, as a triplet method. However, this is the binary case. For example, consider the ranking case. Can you even imagine what's the multiplication of two rankings? For that, we need some different uh, perspective. Fortunately, uh, we observed the notion of distance is common to our labels. And we found that they are very closely related to the previous uh, label model. So here is our main idea. Uh, previously, the binary accuracy term measures how correlated two labels and uh, weak labels are. However, um, we don't, sometimes we don't have a notion of high correlation, but the essential property of metric space is the existence of metric distance. So we just re replace correlation with distance and we hope to get uh, labeling functions that have small average distance to the two label. So basically we want to we want our labeling function to be close to true labels. Here are some examples of distance in labels. When label space have some structure, typically they come with distance metric. For example, in rankings, uh, candle tau distance counts how many adjacent swaps uh, need to make two permutation the same. We have Euclidean distance in regression and the distance in Riemannian uh, manifold is just distance following some uh, surface in the manifold. Using those distance, we can represent uh, how much each labeling function is close to true label. Distances uh, can generalize uh, majority voting, so uh, which is uh, the simplest aggregation method. The y estimate that minimize the sum distance to weak labels is the majority voting solution. And we can improve this with some weight based on the accuracy. For example, plugging in a distance function and changing the product into the sum, uh, we can expand the triplet method to Euclidean space, which corresponds to regression problem. Such a triplet methods can be developed case by case based on the um, again, metric space uh, using the intrinsic property of the given metric space. Uh, even when we cannot easily find such a relation. Hey, Chango, quick question. Yes, sure. So you mentioned that you're encountering um, ranking problems as well over here, right? So right. you're dealing with LFs that deal with the ranking problems. I was curious to know how an LF that works on a ranking problem would look like. So does it give a ranking for every single uh, data point or a ranking only for two or three data points? How exactly would a, an LF look like for a ranking problem? 
each labeling function gives some um, uh, permutation of items and we can combine those um, yeah, permutations. Okay, so the, in a ranking function, the labeling function acts on all the data points. Yeah. In the case of some of the labeling functions, especially in like classification, binary classification, mm -hmm. you also have situations where the LF abstains. Yeah, yeah. So how is there LF abstaining in a ranking problem or must the LF work on every single data? Must it give an exhaustive ranking or can it abstain in like ranking? How does that work? As uh, We studied the partial ranking setting. So some uh, rankings are, are fully given, but some rankings are partially given. Even in that case, uh, our label model worked. So we use inter intrinsic uh, property of metric space to get some kind of triplet method for each uh, metric space. But even if when uh, it's difficult to find them, it's still possible to get label model using existing label model in metric space. We can use embeddings to reduce the problem to the metric space, which we are already familiar with. Classic result in differential manifold um, reverse is uh, very open possible. And for example, hyperbolic space can be mapped into our the uh, Euclidean vector space. So here, key concept is uh, isometric embedding, which preserves uh, distance of label, label space. So by isometry, we just move some label to other uh, metric space, but but we can still get the equivalent solution. Finally, after learning accuracy parameters, uh, we can infer pseudo labels given weak labels. From our label, uh, maximum likelihood estimation induces a weighted version of majority vote. So empirically, we showed our method in various settings. So first in ranking, we show that uh, we can obtain performance comparable to human annotation by adding um, more and more labeling functions. And we got some similar uh, result in regression. The main takeaway of this project was that labels can be aggregated in any metric space. And we are very excited about the potential application to um, alignment problem. Can you go back to the slide where you had shown um, the comparison? Yeah. So she's asking if uh, more LFs result in a lower accuracy or what's exactly happening with the axes here? Uh, yes. So here x axis is number of labeling functions and y is the conductor distance to the true labels. It's better if it has low numbers. Um, yes. So what is the weak supervision uh, baseline? Here, baseline is a majority voting. Did you compare with the snorkel uh, baseline? Yeah, we have that in paper, but the baseline, that baseline, we just convert the ranking uh, to some permutation. So if we have five items, then five factorial is the all possible permutation. Then okay, we can okay. just convert it to clarification problem and use snorkel. How did the snorkel baseline, I guess, perform on the IMDB dataset because that's a binary classification dataset, right? It was worse than this label model because that does not consider the uh, metric structure of uh, linking. So uh, an audience member is asking, uh, what was the distance metric used in these experiments? In this case, the experiments was uh, about ranking and we used the Kendall Tau distance. Here, Kendall Tau distance counts the number of adjacent swaps needed. So for example, if we want to uh, make the one to three uh, be the same with uh, three to one, first we just swap two, three, and uh, three, one, that count two. We swap here, then count, count to another one that makes it the distance three. This is similar with bubble sorting count. And switching gears, uh, I will I'll be discussing um mechanism behind a uh, weak to strong generalization. An additional reason, a uh, weak supervision can be useful. When when I was uh, taking weak supervision one hundred and one, I was very curious why we don't just use the labor model instead of uh, training the end model because. The training uh, end model requires an additional training and labeling functions are often just a usable even in the test set. 
So I, I was not sure the end model can outperform the labor model. So at the time, I just ran the uh, quick experiments and it actually gave um, better performance. But recently, this phenomenon was re-examined uh, in a different context. So last year, uh, OpenAI start, started talking about uh, super alignment. So their speculative and sci-fi question was, so previously we trained the AI because we have better intelligence than um, ML models. Now AI uh, have uh, improved much and AI um, got super human level intelligence, then how can we align such strong artificial intelligence with a weak um, human intelligence? And then they, they made an analogy that as a weak model can teach a uh, strong model, uh, we can align a uh, strong model. So they called it a uh, weak to strong generalization, which is the phenomenon that a uh, strong model can perform better than weak supervisor. This is practically the same with the weak supervision setting. I will explain their experiment set up a bit. So they trained weak supervisor model, GPT-2, uh, to the downstream task first and then generate pseudo labels for the task with that super, uh, weak supervisor. And then they uh, train GPT-4 with pseudo label data and the pseudo labels like was given by uh, GPT-2. Surprisingly, or as expected, uh, even naive fine tuning on the pseudo labels can achieve much better performance than the weak supervisor set. So they achieved almost uh, almost a GPT three level performance with weakly supervised model. So here our claim is that overlapping easy and hard patterns in our data set are the key to weak to strong generalization. Uh, we had a question from the audience. Um, Diaz asking, is the GPT two teacher trained on the ground truth label? Oh yes. So. Yeah, the claim was uh, the overlapping uh, easy and hard patterns in our data set are the key to weak uh, to strong generalization. So we assume that we can, we can partition our data set into data points with only easy patterns and data points with hard patterns only, and some overlap portion that has both the easy and hard patterns. In a synthetic experiment, uh, we observed that by increasing overlap ratio strong model can perform better than a weak model. Our intuition is something like this. So what's the main difference uh, between weak model and strong model? Of course, we can just tell the number of uh, model parameters, but we see the main difference is the capability to extract uh, features from the given data. In the previous experiment setting, weak model can extract a limited feature but uh, they have some knowledge about the given task. Strong model can extract much more diverse and rich features, but they don't know how to use them for the given task. In overall density or overall uh, data points, weak supervisor can generate relatively accurate pseudo labels based on the easy, easy patterns. So for car, we can uh, the weak supervisor just can see the, their wheels. And then storm storm model learn from those pseudo labels, but um uh, it already have a lot of uh good features. It's just a need to learn how to use them for the test. So it can learn how to use easy and hard features for the test um altogether. After uh training storm model in such a way. Given the, the data points with hard features only, storm model can perform well even in uh, even um, in the case that the uh, weak model cannot perform well. Storm model learned uh, how to use their uh, features, but uh, weak uh, weak supervisor model don't at the beginning uh, doesn't know how to use uh, how to extract such features. In, in practice, it's not trivial to extract the overlap density because it's entirely latent. Uh, so how do you know which data points um, are just, just easy or just hard or 
they are overlapped. So we developed a prototype of overlap detection algorithm based on the simplicity bias or shortcut learning of deep learning models. Um, I won't go into details here, but we can detect this data slice. And we designed some experiment to see how important the overlap density is. So using this algorithm, uh, we uh, first extract the over overlap proportion and non-overlap proportion, and then control the overlap ratio in the data set while keeping the uh, data set size constant and see the uh, binary performance. Here, uh, we used the, the GPT-2 as a weak supervisor and used um, the larger models uh, such as GPT-2 medium, large, or x-large, or and additionally, uh, Pi-3 mini as the strongest model. Uh, so here, x-axis is uh, overlap density, overlap ratio, and y-axis is accuracy. And the top dashed, dashed line represents the accuracy of the strongest model trained on the uh, ground truss model. So we can see that um, as the overlap density increases, accuracy also increases, almost getting close to the uh, strong selling model. Uh, and we found the same effect in traditional weak supervision setting. So here weak supervisor being labor model and the strong student model being ex ex boost. So blue dashed line is the labor model performance, labor model accuracy, and Red uh, dash the line is the accuracy of a strong model uh, trained on true labels. We can see the similar trend in many data sets, though some data sets don't. Uh, we speculate this is mainly due to the limitation of our detection algorithm. And so we are very excited about this data mechanism that enables a weak to strong generalization. So we are expecting several future research research directions. So first direction is um better data source selection method for weak supervision. So if we have a limited budget then we have to choose some data source for weak supervision, then we can construct some data selection algorithm based on uh estimated overlap ratio. And second direction is better data set design. So if uh, we can design data set and generate or data uh, generate a uh, synthetic data set, uh, we want to increase overall portion as much as possible based on this result. For example, if we um, put together easy, easy only examples and hard only examples with the same level, can it uh, boost a strong model training? Third direction is more of an interpretation perspective. So still we don't know uh, which features are easy or hard and why they are, especially in alignment, what, we don't know what's the important fact there. So it would be interesting to study uh, their interpretation or learning dynamics. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Shang Ho. Uh, I actually had a quick question with regards to the algorithm that you had shared. So can we go back a few couple of slides? I guess if you could like briefly explain this algorithm, that would help. And along, I'm especially interested in like step four, which says perform feature selection to identify top row features. There is a simplicity bias in neural networks, so they can learn um, simple features, or we are saying uh, easy features first uh, at, at the early stage of training. So we train the uh, first model first on the data and then see uh, st uh, stop at the very early uh, epoch or stage and then see which uh, features on the on the pen, pen ultimate layer have strong weights. We consider that they are they represent some easy features. We identify easy features in that way. And in the second stage, we retrain the model with by uh, of weighting the wrong examples in the first stage data points with having some hard hard features. Uh, by doing so, we want to uh, make model learn how to use hard features as well. After that, we 
uh, block some simple, simple, easy features at the second stage. And then even when, even when they are blocked, uh, if we uh, make correct predictions, we consider them as uh, that it, they have uh, hard features. I think I get the intuition, but I probably have to spend some time reading the paper to understand the full thing. Thanks so much, Shanko. Thanks for the very interesting presentation. Thank you everyone for joining as well.